In this beautiful cemetery, in this small town in Kentucky, lies our next adventure. Hey everyone, it's Cashew. Today's adventure brings us to Riverside Cemetery in Falmouth, Kentucky. And I'm at the grave of King of the Bootleggers, George Remus, and his third wife, Blanche. And at the end of this video, on the end card, I'll have a video that goes more in depth about George and the tragic ending of his second wife. So stick around. Our adventure starts here. George Remus was born in Germany, and when he was young, his family moved to the U.S. And they started off in New York and moved around and finally wound up in Chicago. And at age 14, he left school and worked with his Uncle George in his pharmacy. At age 18, he lied about his age because he had to be 21, and he put himself through school to become a pharmacist. It was in Chicago where he met his first wife, Lillian, and they had a daughter named Romola. Remus had a brilliant mind. He was also an optometrist as well as a lawyer. And it was when he moved down to Cincinnati with his second wife, Imogene, that he put his lawyer as well as his pharmaceutical skills to use. When the Volstead Act took effect, Remus did his research and discovered that 85% of whiskey being produced passed through Cincinnati or was at least within a 300 mile radius of Cincinnati. During Prohibition, the only time you could have whiskey is if it were for medicinal purposes or if you were a baker. And since Remus was a licensed pharmacist, he found a loophole and made a lot of money. So here you have Remus. He has distilleries. He has his drug manufacturing company. And so he's now shipping off his medicinal whiskey. And one night, he wound up being hijacked and was hit on the head and still had the scar to show it and it gave him two ideas. One was he needs to start having armed guards take his product to its destination. And then he also had the idea to hijack himself and then take that whiskey and bootleg it. In addition to being known as King of the Bootleggers, Remus was also known as King of the Payoffs. And he greased a lot of palms. And he had the brilliant idea to go to Washington and become acquainted with the Harding administration. And specifically, he became well acquainted with a man named Jess Smith. With the help of Jess Smith, Remus believed he could stay out of jail and that he had good fortune on his side. But his luck ran out. Eventually, Remus's luck ran out and he was arrested by agents and he was afraid he was going to go to federal prison. But Jess Smith assured him he would not be going to prison. Then something horrible happened. Jess Smith committed suicide just a few days after meeting with Remus, and Remus was on his own. Remus was sentenced to two years in federal prison, and while he was serving his time, Imogene met Franklin Dodge. Dodge was a federal agent, and when he discovered that Imogene not only had power of attorney, but Remus also had lots of assets, he quit the agency and began wooing Imogene, and Imogene fell hard and fast for Dodge. Imogene and Dodge sold all of Remus' assets and they hid the money. And according to one source, they also tried to get Remus deported back to Germany unsuccessfully. And they also tried to put a hit on Remus and that failed as well. So Remus gets out of prison. Imogene and Dodge have set up house using all of Remus' assets and Imogene is beginning divorce proceedings. So on October 6, 1927, Imogene and her daughter left the Alms Hotel in Walnut Hills, Ohio, and Remus follows them and has the driver run them off the road. And Imogene gets out of the car and runs away. Remus catches up with her and puts a bullet in her. And later, on the operating table at Deaconess Hospital, Imogene dies. To make a long story short, Remus turned himself in, and being a lawyer, he represented himself in court, and he was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. At the time, using temporary insanity as a defense was relatively unheard of. It also didn't hurt that he paid off a lot of people and had German roots just like many people in Cincinnati. After a couple of months, Remus got out of Longview Hospital and he met a woman named Blanche Watson and she became his third wife. Remus spent the rest of his days in real estate living in Covington, Kentucky. And in 1952, Remus died of a heart attack. 
Blanche died in 1974. Before we leave, let me show you some of the monuments in this cemetery. Some of them are very old and really beautiful. Buried next to George and Blanche are two other graves with the surname Watson. And Watson was Blanche's maiden name. And there are several graves here with the last name Watson. So I presume these must be Blanche's relatives. This is the grave of Homer T. Watson. And he died at age 26. And if you recall what I've told you before about grave iconography, this represents a life cut short. This is a beautiful monument. It has an Art Deco look to it. I've never seen a grave decorated like this before. If you look in the foreground, you see solar lights. And then you have these autumn leaves with baskets of flowers. I noticed a lot of the graves in this cemetery have been decorated by the loved ones of the departed. Wow, this is one of the most ornate graves I've ever seen. This grave reminds me of one I might see in New Orleans. And here's another one that has an Art Deco feel to it. So that's the rise and fall of George Remus. And at the end of this video on the end card, I'll have a link to a video I made where we actually visit the site of where George Remus shot and killed Imogene. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share on your social media. Until next time, everyone, this is Cashew, signing off.